Good morning and welcome to today's health and safety webinar, an introduction to mental health first aid. As usual, before we start, we would like to introduce ourselves. And today's webinar will be run by Dom Greenwood, who is our senior health and safety and environmental management consultant. And he's also a national safety trainer, health and safety, fire safety, food safety and first aid, safeguarding and mental health. I'm Victoria Templeton supporting today's webinar and I shall help field the question and run today's polls. And because we have lots of you who have joined us today, we have to place you all on mute, but we do want to hear your questions. So we will be taking your questions at the end. So please do let us know of any that you have noting them in the question box that you have available. And here's a quick guide to show you how you do that. So you'll have a go to webinar panel on your screen that should look something like this. Please type your question in the questions pane and we'll aim to read out as many as we can at the end. And for those of you who are regulars on our webinars, we do like to make our sessions as interactive as possible. And so we do like to run a series of interesting polls throughout. So when we do have a poll, it will appear on your screen like this. And then we'll launch the poll and you select the answer that's appropriate for you. Please note, though, that to be able to participate in the polls, you will need to ensure that your screen is not in full screen mode, as for some reason, GoToWebinar doesn't operate when it's in the full screen mode. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand over the um, webinar now to Dom and he'll take you on in the um, take you through the webinar. Hi, everybody, Thank and you. welcome to. Can you see that? Can you see that? Victoria? Yep. OK, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dom Greenwood, as Victoria said, Senior Health, Safety and Environmental Management Consultant. And welcome to today's, uh, in fact, the first of uh, this year's Health and Safety at Work uh, webinars. And, and obviously we're, we're looking at mental health uh, first aid. So there's a quick agenda for you. Um, we're going to look at what is mental health. I think it's important to actually go right the way back and talk about what mental health actually is. The different impact of mental health problems, something called stigma and the way that affects people. First aid for mental health and how you can then use that in the workplace. How you can build a positive culture. The NHS five steps to mental, uh, mental well-being. And then how we can help you as an organisation with the various different links um, and future webinars. And then, as Victoria said earlier, we're going to finish today's session with, with, with questions. And if we don't get a chance to, to answer your question, please, uh, please email. We'll take an email and we'll get those answers back out to you. So I think it's important to, to think about what mental health is. And I think the reason we actually decided or I decided to run a mental health uh, webinar in January was just really because for some people, it's probably the worst month of the year after Christmas. You know, we had Blue Monday a couple of weeks ago. We're still we're still very much in the throes of um, COVID. And I was only kind of listening to the radio this morning to hear that, you know, the music sector uh, uh, and the performing rights sector has lost over 70,000 jobs uh, for, for songwriters and musicians and things like that. So it got me thinking that if that if that's the way that sector is, then it's probably going to be similar in other sectors. So that's going to have a massive impact on on people's mental health. So that's one of the reasons we decided to run this in January. But mental health really is uh, how we think, feel and act. We've all got mental health. And I think, again, it gets confused uh, and negative connotations uh, put around mental health. Um, helps us determine how we handle stress and also relate to other people and make choices, not only through our junior years, but through to adulthood, as we, as we know. So it starts at an early age when we start to develop, goes through our adolescence and into adulthood and covers a broad range of mental health problems. Um, you'll, have all, you'll all be aware of things like depression, anxiety and panic attacks, but there's a number of others as well that we're obviously not going to get a chance to cover today. What you're seeing is largely um, the first part of a mental health first aid course that we run that would normally last between kind of five and six hours. Um, and this is kind of the introduction to that. But there's a number of different mental health issues that can be linked to, to people ranging from diff various different phobias, bipolar, PTSD you'll have heard of, postnatal depression and schizophrenia, and there's loads of others as well. I think it's really important not to see mental health as a negative. Um, poor mental health can lead to mental health illnesses, and there is a, there is a difference which we're going to explore shortly. Mental illnesses need to be diagnosed by a healthcare professional, a doctor, 
somebody of that that level w would diagnose diagnose a mental health illness, and obviously the person could be uh, given treatment, medication, or, or a, and a series of different treatments. Mental health and mental health illnesses are not the same thing, and I think it's really important that employers and employees know the differences uh, between those because until we understand the differences between those it's going to be difficult to help people in the workplace who are suffering from maybe low mental health or mental illness now a mental illness will affect obviously someone's mental health as as we all know but somebody could have a mental health problem but not be diagnosed with a mental health illness and there's a number of different mental health issues that there could be if we think about mental health, mental illnesses, that could then uh, encompass a, a wide range of disorders uh, that we just talked about. And it, it's, it's something that affects the person's brain chemistry and function, uh, but it can also include their, their general mood, different personality disorders and things like eating disorders and a whole host of others. So there's a number of different mental, mental illnesses and it's a very complex field, as, you, as you'll appreciate. Each mental illness has different symptoms and can impact on the person's life directly and differently. Um, it can absolutely, absolutely impact the person in their everyday life through to work, through to relationships and, and, and everything in between. But it does need, as we said already, to be diagnosed and treated professionally. The main difference is that mental health fluctuates. So uh, you will have all had bad days and good days and di various different triggers can can set off a mental health issue. Um, I was only talking to a client this morning who's unfortunately going to a, a family funeral today, lost her, lost her auntie last week or a couple of weeks ago. And that's really, really affecting her mental health, as you'll appreciate, she was very close to this, this, this family member. And due to other things, this is the one thing that's kind of tipped her over the edge with, with some other work issues and family problems and, and various things. So it only takes one uh, issue uh, to tip the balance uh, in the favour of, men of mental health or negative mental health, but it doesn't have to be a mental illness. Mental illnesses uh, won't be caused or cured by factors going on in someone's life, but they can be, as we just said, a, a contributory factor. So if we look at the impact of mental health day to day, tasks and activities, mental health can affect many areas of life and impact on, on a person's family, social life and relationships. You could be working with somebody in the workplace, whether you're in an industrial workplace, an office situation, a factory, a laboratory, it doesn't matter. And you're seeing somebody on a daily basis and you've seen that person every day, maybe for three, four, five, ten years. Um, they may be putting a very, very brave face on something that's happening in their personal life that can affect their day to day uh, activities that you may never know about. But it could be that one that one um, trigger point that could send them over the edge. Mental health can affect someone's physical health, it can lead on to more serious conditions. Um, the body releases, as you know, different substances and different chemicals and due to low mood and different mental health issues that could then lead on to different uh, problems and more serious problems. And it can impair the ability to protect and develop physical well-being and certainly in a, in a younger age. And we are seeing mental health issues develop more in the teenage years. And, and some of the courses I'm teaching, there's more. I'm getting more teenagers and young people attend who are saying they're having problems with regards to mental health. It absolutely can help, can sorry, can hinder the work and, and in the workplace. People who suffer from mental health issues and mental illness often have difficulty in securing and maintaining a job. Uh, there's various different reasons why, and we're going to go into those shortly. But when the symptoms of the mental health condition develop, it makes that person uh, often not function normally, and they can't often hold down a job uh, and often have to go go off sick, which is which is a shame can also impair driving, depending on the different medications the person is on, but can also hinder their reactions to drive. And, and, and in severe cases, they, they, they sometimes have to stop driving. Absolutely, can, it can affect people's relationships with their partners, if they're parents and with their children and wider family members. Going out socially is often a problem. Um, and attending children's events, school events, things like that, and just sometimes in worst cases, actually looking after the children as well. So absolutely mental health can Im impact on that. And something called stigma, which we're going to deal with shortly, uh, which is the negative behaviours around mental health and mental illness, absolutely has uh, and can have an even bigger effect on the person. It exacerbates the, the whole condition due to the negative impact that other people can have um, due to society really 
and the way that mental health and mental ill health is, is perceived. So there's a really good um, link there, which you, you'll get uh, when Victoria sends out the presentation. And, and the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive, release their figures every year. Um, and I think we sent this out before. And this is the updated uh, figures from the work-related stress, anxiety, and depression statistics. Um, and there's some good numbers on there. I say good, but not good in that respect, but uh, good to, to get some context. But you can see there that 822,000 workers are currently, or were in the last year, were suffering from some kind of work-related stress, depression, or anxiety. Now, that, that, that stress, depression, or anxiety may not have come from the workplace, but the, these, the, the people that have um, completed the surveys and, and, all the, and all the stuff that goes around that have suggested that, that, that work is a contributory factor. And again, there's a further 451,000 workers there that are suffering from some, some new case of work-related stress, depression, or anxiety. So if we add those two together, we're talking about way over a million people in the UK uh, or Great Britain that are suffering from a work-related uh, stress, anxiety, or depression situation. And that'd be great if employers could recognise that, fellow colleagues and co-workers could recognise that. 17.9, nearly 18 million working days are lost every year due to, again, work-related stress, depression, or anxiety. And if we think about the impact that has on, you know, the, the, the national economy, but also the workplace in general to cover work, cover shifts, production, whatever that might be, you can appreciate now how, how important looking after our workers is. This is interesting, and I think it's, it's definitely worthy of note that 93,000 workers in that year suffered from COVID, and I still think COVID is playing a massive part to people's mental health. I was teaching a couple of courses recently, um, and uh, and the delegates were really wanted to talk about how COVID has, has affected them, not being able to go out, go on holiday, enjoy enjoy social time, see relatives, go to weddings and funerals, and, and just see Ill, Ill relatives and, uh, and family members that are in care homes and things like that. We've all suffered through it. We're all still suffering through it. Um, uh, and it's definitely had a, a wider effect on, on, us, on us all. 51% of work-related ill health is now attributed to some kind of mental health. So way over half now, which is a, definitely a shift over the last couple of years, is attributed to, to mental health with 55% of all working days lost in the workplace, again, attributed to mental ill health. Workload was the predominant cause of work-related stress, depression, or anxiety. So again, this is something for managers, supervisors, employers to think about workload and how, we, how you can probably disseminate that, delegate that, think about working weeks, flexible working times. And that is, again, the poster that um, you can get, which I, th I think is great. You could you could certainly have that in a staff area. It's just got some bullet points there, pretty much what we just talked about. You can download that from the HSE, um, and it'd be great to, 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 to share that wider, wider amongst your staff team. Other factors that the report suggests, lack of managerial support, organisational changes at work, and role uncertainty. And again, I think that comes from, from COVID again, where companies have had to either close down, merge, lose contracts, whatever it might be. People have certainly been uncertain about their position. And again, Michael Page, who you, you'll probably be aware of, did, did a survey last year. Uh, and one of the stats I've picked out from that is that one in three employees do not feel comfortable talking about this to their manager. So again, thinking about the lines of communication between managers and staff. Do we regularly do one-to-ones, group sessions? quarterly meetings, monthly meetings, or just checking in with staff, because as, we, as we've seen from that stat, 33% of staff don't feel comfortable talking to their manager about this kind of thing. So there's some really good stats on there. When the presentation comes out, there's a link on there to the, um, the 2021 uh, vital statistics. It'd be great for you to have a look at that. I think you'll be able to draw far more than I've just gone through from there. And you may be able to pick out some interesting things to talk to your staff about. So we're going to go to our first poll. Um, I'm going to hand back okay. to Victoria to, to talk to you about that one. And uh, I'll be back with you sh sh shortly. Thank you, Dom. And I'm going to launch the first poll. You might want to move your slide on as well. Um, and the question is around, do you think your mental health is well managed in your workplace? So I'll keep it open for a few moments. Remember, don't be in full screen mode. And we'll see what the results 
look like. I'll keep it open a little bit longer. Okay, I think we're we've uh, leveled off with responses. So let's close the poll, and I'm going to share the results with everybody. So Dom, 64% are saying yes and 36% are saying no. Thank you. That's that, Obviously, that's interesting. Um, great that 64% are saying that mental health is well managed. Um, and, and I'm really, really chuffed with that. It'd be brilliant if that was a high number. And I think for the 36% of you that said no, it'd be great to find out what, why. Um, is it a conversation with management? Is there not a mental health policy? Um, it can be difficult to, to know that, but I think it's um, something to think about. Obviously, when this presentation comes out, there's going to be some links at the end and there's going to be some different tools and toolkit stuff that you could potentially take back and think about um, presenting to the management or the senior managers to think about bringing that into your workplace. For the 64% of you that have got it covered and mental health is well managed, it's great. Let's hope that carries on and um, uh, more initiatives can be put forward. Thank you for taking part in that poll. Just moving on to mental health stigma. In the context of mental health, there's two kinds of stigma. And I'm going to flush these two icons up first because I think there's words on those two icons that you'll you'll know and possibly use. I think if we just take a second to just look at the first picture where we've got words like nuts, paranoid, psycho, insane, weirdo, loner, violent. And in the second picture, we've got crazy, nutter, fruitcake, cuckoo, lunatic, loony, bonkers, and everything else. I think a lot of these words we use as throwaway words in, in society. And I hear these all the time walking around, walking around workplaces. And I have to say, I've used them in the past. And it wasn't really until I attended a mental health course two, three years ago and then decided to get qualified as a trainer that I actually realized I was probably as bad, if not worse, than everybody else using these kind of words um, in the workplace and in friendship groups and at home. And I, and I try really hard not to now because something that was impressed upon me on the training course was that you don't know how that these words are going to make other people feel. Um, we use them on a daily basis. We throw them away and call someone a weirdo or that's nuts or, you know, whatever and worse, but it's how, how that's going to make the person feel. So stigma is a set of uh, negative attitudes, really, and values, which may, may lead to discriminatory and negative behaviours. Um, as I say, I don't think a lot of the time that the, the, the person using that language has any has any recollection or any thoughts or feelings of how it's going to make the other, per other people feel. But you just don't know what people are dealing with. There's two kinds of stigma, social stigma, which is what we're talking about, the negative attitudes and discriminatory behaviours that society has kind of allowed to become normal, really. As I say, we've all grown up with these words and fr uh, phrases and sentences and icons and images. Um, but there's certainly a, a, a negative connotation towards me mental health problems. Self-stigma would be where the person with a mental health problem starts to believe what society is saying and what people in the workplace are saying and people at maybe the football match or wherever you are is true. And they then start to agree with their viewpoints and start to believe that they are disturbed, they're a weirdo, they're a wacko, they're a psycho or whatever it might be. So as a, as a nation, as a society, we've got a, we've got a responsibility to try and cut that out really. And I just think as a, you know, in, in the workplace, it'd be great if managers, mental health first aiders, safety reps, and everybody could, could try and cut down on, on this negative language, because as I say, it, 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 it is out there. It does have a massive effect. There are a number of adverse effects caused by stigma, which would include, include fear of disclosing to peers as a problem. So if we think about maybe in the workplace, somebody's suffering with a mental health problem, maybe they've got an eating disorder, maybe they're, they're suffering from grief, maybe there's something else, depression, anxiety, whatever. If in the workplace there is a high percentage of stigma, they're far less likely to talk to anybody and just go home and deal with it, come back and go home again and deal with it. If we have a, a workplace that hasn't got the stigma in, they're far more likely to talk to colleagues, managers and other people about that. In the same way, people are more reluctant to seek professional support should they be suffering from social stigma or self-stigma or a combination of both. 
there's absolutely a link to victimization harassment and physical violence with people and i've and i've seen it in various different workplaces before you know mental health Ill, illnesses and issues are seen as weak and it's the, that person that gets uh, the bullying and the harassment and, and, and in some cases the physical violence again people that suffer some, for, suffer from various forms of stigma often have difficulties finding employment and taking part in things socially uh, as well so there's there's a link there's a link there lack of understanding from family and friends they then start to develop this practice of self stigmatization they start to believe as i've just said in what they're seeing on tv in the news social media is a massive cause at the moment and in the workplace as though oh that's like me i must be like that and it can actually exacerbate and make any current mental health issues worse so there's a whole whole host of reasons why stigma can affect the individual and be really negative There's absolutely some some tools there to support mental health in the workplace and the first of which which we're going to move on to shortly is mental health first aiders it's something that's kind of been quite popular over the last four to five years uh, my first in a mental health first aid of course about five or six years ago the course has changed and there's various different um, suppliers and providers but it's largely all around how you can bring how you can eradicate uh, stigma in the workplace and support people with a mental health issue in the workplace mental health risk assessments and policies would be available and it's something that we something that we go on and talk about and deliver on the course as well along with a stress risk assessment and policy a really good tool is a WAP and you may some of you may have this and if you haven't you you, you know we can help you with that a workplace wellness action plan thinking about what as an employer and a workplace you're going to put in place to help people's wellness and wellness covers a bit of a broad a broad uh, topic of activities or anything from to, from eating well to things you can do for, at home mental health stress depression uh, and everything in between exercise so just the general wellness of colleagues and staff in the establishment line manager training are the line managers trained to, to recognize mental health problems are they trained how to talk to uh, uh, colleagues and have a supportive conversation or are they just kind of flying blind and they don't really know anything about it so thinking about what training you can give line managers and supervisors so they're more up to date with current mental health issues and the last thing is going to be employee assistance programs and there's a whole host and a variety out there but they would cover things like you know 24-hour staff support so if there's if there's a colleague that's got uh, an issue mental health problem if they're feeling suicidal if they've got grief if they're depressed there is a 24-hour staff support line that they can contact which is confidential and uh, would not report back to that information a lot of the EAPs that that we've, we either work with or have had have an experience of have an online health portal that the members of staff can log on to where they start to get hints and tips on uh, eating well sleeping well exercise getting out in the country and doing doing other things to improve mental health a lot of the APs are supported with apps now apps are massive aren't they everything we do has got an app linked to it whether it's banking or the gym or the cinema or whatever it might be and the APs are no different so an app that people can access all the time uh, for support and wellness for the managers and employers there's there's support guides and different reports that they can run to see um, not necessarily individuals names but how, how many times the the EAP has been used and the EAPs are really good for signposting, giving giving the colleague or the or the workers links on where to go for further support. And a lot of them have a daily blog or, or a daily or a weekly or monthly webinar or a thought of the day or something like that to try and increase motivation and to try and uh, get people thinking positively uh, about their mental health. So if you've not considered an EAP, there's absolutely loads out there. We've got some that we can we can support with as well. So there's a number of tools available for managers, owners, employers to put in place to help support mental health. I just want you to think for a second about your organization and think about your staff and think about your line managers. Is there anyone you could think about now who would be good at listening to people? Can keep calm in a stressful and emotional situation. Is there somebody that might be looking for a new challenge? We're in a new year, new calendar year. So is there somebody that thinks well they want to do something different, maybe support the business and support people more? Is there somebody that they that the workers and the colleagues would trust? And they themselves are trustworthy, professional, and eager to help. 
And if the answer is yes to one or maybe all of those questions, I think you might have just found yourself a mental health first aider, because they're all of the different traits and qualities that the uh, would be akin to the mental health first aider. They need to be absolutely good at listening to people, um, be calm if there's a stressful and emotional situation, somebody that, that wants a little bit more responsibility and might want to be your mental health champion, but they need to be trustworthy, professional and eager to help people um, and equally they need to be somebody that all the staff will trust. So just think and maybe think about who this person could be. And if you're a multi-departmental or multi-site company, you may have to think about one, uh, two, three, four or five colleagues that could be upskilled to be your mental health first aider. What is mental health first aid? So it's the initial support provided to a person that's experiencing a mental health problem until professional help arrives. So if you think about it like first aid, medical first aid, somebody has an injury at work, falls off a ladder, somebody slips, trips or has a medical emergency, you'd have a first aid on duty that would help them. Um, and it could just be holding their hand and talking to them, it could be putting bandages on, it could be putting them in a recovery position until the ambulance, first responder, police, fire arrive. The mental health first aid is no different. It's the initial support given to somebody that's displaying negative mental health issues in the workplace or they've disclosed to you they've got a problem. The aims of being a mental health first aid would be to identify these early stages. They often, there's often triggers uh, or changes in behaviour or changes in emotion or changes in people's patterns that would give the mental health first aid some, some um, early knowledge that there, there could be a mental health first aid situation coming. Absolutely, this uh, mental health first aider would look to try and remove or reduce the amount of stigma associated in, in, in the workplace with Ill, Ill mental health. If they see or hear um, negative behaviours, they would then uh, think about strategies um, and communication and education to try and eradicate that from the, the factory or the workforce or the office or whatever it might be. They need to think about helping staff members recover quickly and that could be providing them with information, calling them on a sort of weekly basis, checking in, giving them links. But absolutely in its, in its, in its, in its uh, worst sense, it could be about preserving that person's life if they're in the workplace and they're, they've done, you know, maybe if they're taking an overdose or if they've got tools that they're gonna, they're threatening to do things with, or if they've gone home and you get, get a phone call, it's about trying to preserve that person's life until medical uh, emergency services can get there. Providing immediate comfort and support, and trying to prevent that condition from getting any worse, because obviously we don't want it to get any worse. Promote recovery of good mental health by signposting. A lot of the time it's signposting do the people that are displaying negative mental health uh, uh, situations know who to talk to. Uh, there's so many more, uh, there's so many more um, agencies and groups out there now. It's not just about Samaritans um, and, uh, and all the other ones that we know of. There are so many. Um, there's one called Andy's Man Club. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. It's it's for my, for men who are, who you know who have lost relatives and family and friends. That's really really good. There's no there's no end of eating disorder ones out there. Suicide prevention, fraud uh, and gambling addiction. There's there's loads out there that the mental health first aid would have all of the knowledge and all the links to provide uh, anybody that needed those in the workplace. So signposting to profes professional services and support is a massive part of the aims of the first aid, mental health first aider. And then as and when the, the colleague comes back to work, the mental health first aider would support them in the workplace, thinking about what, you know, what, what, they, what their duties need to be, uh, communication, regular meetings, and just trying to support that person back in the workplace. So there's a few aims of the mental health first aider there. I'm going to flash these up as a whole, really, because there's a few there that we haven't covered, but absolutely identifying signs and symptoms of mental ill health. But listening, the point four, listening non-judgmentally and providing reassurance, a big part of the mental health first aider is to listen and not, not kind of jump in uh, and finishing off sentences. It's about starting the supportive conversation and, and listening uh, to that person. And it's not always about finding the answers. It's about talking about the, the, the issue and probably laying out some different alternatives and signposting to encourage professional support. Absolutely providing and trying to promote a positive culture in the workplace and working with senior managers and senior leaders in the workplace to try and think of initiatives and different things that staff can get involved with uh, to try and keep mental health positive in the workplace. 
And the last point there is maintain confidentiality. It's not about running to the HR department and saying, oh, so-and-so has got a problem in the factory. They're, they've got really bad mental health. I think we need to think about suspending them or, or, you know, thinking about their duties. It's about keeping things confidential, but also keeping reports and record keeping and following up should, should you need to ever access that at any particular time. So I'm going to hand back to Victoria for our second uh, poll, which is, uh, do you. you have mental health first aiders in your workplace? It'd be really good to know what the percentage of uh, all of our delegates are today to understand okay. what the take up of mental health first aid is. Right, I'm going to launch the poll. And I'll keep it open for a few minutes. Keep it open a little bit longer. Okay. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So there you go, Dom. 41% do, 59% do not. Thank you, Victoria, and thanks everybody for taking part in that second poll. So Obviously, it's disappointing that workplaces aren't engaging with this, these kind of strategies and that only 41% of, of, of companies represented today have got the mental health first aider in place, um, with obviously nearly 60% saying they haven't got it. So um, I think it's something to think about. It's great that you're on here today. I think um, it'd be good to go back to senior managers and leaders and uh, you know, and the people that hold the, the budgets for training to think about maybe you could you could have one or two or how many you think you, you might need uh, and we're absolutely here to help uh, advise or help with training on that so it's uh thanks for taking part in that it's good to know what else can employers do i think the biggest thing employers can do and if we've got managers on on the call today building a positive culture in the workplace we absolutely need to think about how we can Im implement a positive culture in the workplace and trying to keep staff in a positive nature develop a mental health action plan and policy. There's there's a number of tools out there that we can, this can be documented in in as well. And it doesn't have to be arduous, it doesn't have, doesn't have to be really, really um, detailed. It's just thinking about what, what is your mental health action plan gonna be like? And uh, I think it needs to reflect your company, uh, your visions, your values, your staff, your business, your sector. And this could be really, really good. Um, don't just treat it as a paper exercise and put it on the shelf. It needs to be uh, talked about and. The staff need to help with it as well. Providing mental health training across the organisation, you know, we're finding over the years that health and safety training and fire safety training and first aid training is much, much, much better than it ever was. And clients I'm working with are, you know, upward of 80 to 90 percent now. But we've we've just seen from that last poll that uh, mental health training and, and, and mental health first aiders is is sitting around 40 percent, which is which is obviously quite low. So I was thinking about how how employers can provide that training across their organisation. It could be about thinking about adjusting people's roles to accommodate new responsibilities. It could be that staff have left and, you know, you have to then change that person's role to to cover people who've left. And because of COVID, there's there's a number of different positions that where people are not in anymore. But it's having it's having the uh, the awareness of the impact that makes on the individual who are quite happily saying, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. But can they cope with that? Are they stressed with that? Are they going to get anxious about it? Deadlines? Does that then lead to depression and further mental mental health illness? So it's thinking about being transparent about what you want staff to do. A really big one, I think, is publicising your company's commitment to mental health. Is there a central area where um, people can go to look at mental health material and health and safety material and first aid material? But is there a poster on a board that has got all the links on? Do they know who your mental health champion or first aider is or ambassador, call it what you will? Do they know what to do? Um, because they may not ask, but they may just go to a website or they may go to a notice board. Have you got the app? Are you, are you using links? Have you got a WhatsApp group where you can talk to people? So it's the, the company's commitment to how you're going to deal with that. And as we just said, this dedicated space for mental health information. Is there one place in the foyer or in the staff area or whatever your company and how you're set up they can go to um, just to visit at a lunch break or whatever it might be, just to look at stuff? It's just worth thinking about. And I've just entitled that slide, Be Visual. I think 
actually seeing things is really good. The first poster there is mental health first aid at work. We've got the same poster in our office. It's just hints and tips for, for staff about eating well and activities and, and different things that you can do. And I think it's good to, to have that on a board. The one to the top right is, you know, the top 10 tips for, for mental health in the workplace. And then the one in the middle is 15 tips to develop good mental health. They're all doing a similar job. There's various different formats that these kind of posters are displayed in. And the one that, one on the bottom left is healthy minds at work. You have a healthy you have a healthy work life balance. Your job demands are, are reasonable. So it just gives again gives the employer and the employee different uh, ideas. The one on the far right is uh, just a general um, poster there. You, who's your mental health first aider? We're used to seeing these around the workplace with your first aider is and your fire safety officer is, but it'd be great to get these around with your mental health first aider is with the location would be the department, so factory one or the body shop or the office or whatever it might be. So think about maybe being visual and putting the putting one or two of these posters around. They cost very little, download them often for free, um, but you're talking pence really. But think about where these would sit in your establishment. And I think a really good example is that, and this is just a board that I've seen, taking a picture of, this is a, a, the mental health uh, board in a, in a company. Um, it doesn't have to be like that in your establishment, but this is just one I saw that I thought was really good. You can quite clearly see who the mental health first aider is in that in that um, picture. You've then got different hints and tips for the top 10 keys to happier living, post to left to that. Weekly wellbeing checkup they're doing, I think that's really good. They're doing take, take 10 uh, minutes to think about different stuff on the top right there. And being your colleagues called, I think is great. You know, one in four of us will experience mental health problems this year. So there's a really good visual resource there that staff can go to just to spend a few minutes on. When you've got new staff joining the company, can it be part of the induction? When you do your site tour, this is our first aid area. This is our mental health first aid area. And this is what we're gonna, this is what we, we do. This is the app we use. This is our mental health policy. So I think being visual is really, really important. Building a positive mental health culture, managers and senior leaders, really need to think about spending more time talking to staff and getting to know their employees. You know, don't be the manager that sits in the office and only comes out once a day to go down to get your lunch or, you know, to the washroom. Actively go around and talk to staff and welcome new employees to the company, ask how they're doing and take take an interest in their life. If, you know, if they're getting married or if they've got uh, children or holiday coming up or whatever it might be, that goes a long way with staff. If the managing director or CEO or owner actually comes to talk to them about what they're doing and how they're feeling. Think about introducing networks, initiatives and activities uh, which could involve mental health um, and allow staff to actively become involved with health services and return to work schemes should they have been off. It's great to involve staff with decision making and no that's not always possible and so obviously high level decisions that involve the board and the chairman and things like that it's going to be difficult to do that but it could be you could put together a staff working group where every department or division or site is represented and maybe you meet on a quarterly basis just to feed in your ideas that would then go into a more detailed plan for the organisation. It'd be great if the company could get behind um, staff learning a new life skill. A company I worked at uh, three or four years ago now allowed um, staff to undertake a new language or learn a new, a new language and of the 24 staff that worked there I think four or five learnt Spanish and the company paid for it and then the following year they then went on to a different language. It's not for everybody but those four or five people really enjoyed it and it was once a week uh, and the company paid for that and it was really good and really well received. So I think don't just give it lip service, make sure it happens and I think we talked about some of these and flashing them up again but the mental health risk assessment and stress, st stress risk assessment and workplace wellness action plan, think about uh, putting them in place and if you've got this mental health first aider or champion they could act actively be involved with that. Think about different counselling services you might have in the local area should you have a mental health issue or god forbid a, a major first aid incident or a death on site or whatever that might be who is going to come in and talk to your staff it'd be far better to get that engaged now than when it happens and then you're then scrabbling around to think about well, who's going to come in um, equally if you engage with a local counselling company they'll probably come in and talk to staff and do a lot of this stuff for free so it's worth forging those links now Think about allowing greater flexibility for time off for those that need it. If they're if they're having problems at home or if they're going through uh, tricky situations or whatever it might be, think about allowing uh, 
greater flexibility. Obviously, we're all used to now home working. Some sectors and some industries is far more difficult to do that in manufacturing or industry. But think about how you will structure people's working weeks. You don't have to stick to doing the nine till five different shift patterns, weekends, uh, and think about your opening hours as well, which in turn would then promote better working life balances. Holding events in the company, do you do a family day every year where maybe staff can bring family members? Do you do a summer, a summer event, or a Christmas event, um, or maybe a, a monthly Teams event that we, we've started doing at work and, and, and all staff are jumping on and really enjoying that? In fact, Victoria recently recently ran a murder mystery event, which um, went down really well and people really enjoyed that. So things like that, that take a bit of organising, but it really works well. Meditation apps, online mental health resources we talked about, linked to the um, employee assistance program. And again, we already talked about a mental health champion or working group. These are just ideas to help think about stuff that you can put in place. These are the five steps that the NHS um, recommend based on evidence and research. Connecting, be active, keep learning, give to others and be mindful. So we can improve our well-being by building these five steps into our day-to-day -day lives. If you give them a try, you may feel happier. So this is something you could absolutely um, advertise on your mental health board or in your health and safety area or whatever it might be. Connect, people like talking to other people. There's obviously people in your organization that you know don't like talking to other people, but do they not like talking to other people because they think they're gonna be um, mocked or not taken seriously? So people in, like to talk in groups, in person, but obviously at the moment more virtually. Connect with people around you, family, friends, colleagues, neighbours, spend time developing these relationships. Be active and at the moment we're put at home. Um, it's more difficult to get in, get in and get out at the moment. So you don't have to don't have to go to the gym, do stuff at home, take walks. Could you be the company that promotes healthy walks or the daily walk? There's another company I work with that do a weekly walk where 50, 60 staff literally walk around the complex and then do a smaller exercise session. It's once a week, everybody enjoys it. Um, and about 70% of the staff do that. But it doesn't have to be that, it's what's gonna work for your company. Learning, we talked about learning new skills. It doesn't have to be learning a language like we talked about. It could be cooking, it could be playing a musical instrument, it could be fixing things, DIY, art, it could be anything, but it could be, could you be the company that pioneers that and get somebody in to talk to staff about what they could do to keep learning? It could be that you're going to talk about learning and development with regards to job role or progression. So think about how you do that. Giving to others gives people a real sense of achievement. Um, even the smallest that can count. Um, we put their NHS homeless and vaccines. A friend of mine uh, decided to be, become a vaccine um, administrator at the early, early part of the year, just because he wanted to give something back and he's got so much from doing that. So think about what you can maybe give back. You can improve your mental wellbeing and help build new social networks by talking to other people. And obviously the NHS and the vaccine at the moment are massive due to COVID. But we've also still got the problem of homeless in this country. Um, animal welfare, whatever it might be, think about how you could give back to society in your local area. And probably the biggest thing you can do is be mindful, be more aware of your present moment. Think about how you think and feel, your body and the world around you. It's often wrapped up in this world, in this work called mind mindfulness. It can positively change the way you feel about life. Only you can change the way you think and feel. So we can, you can provide all this support to staff, friends and family, but it's down to that individual to try and think differently. And that's often the most difficult thing, but it's about supporting the, the people whilst they're doing that. I'm going to hand over to Victoria for our, I think it's our final poll or it's our, it's our, it's our third poll. Yeah. You're, yeah, that's right. Let's launch the poll for you. And it's, do you think you need more support or help or guidance for mental health at work? So again, I'll leave it open for a few minutes. Okay. I'll close it and I'll share the results for you. 
so we have 65 percent yes they do feel that they would like more support help and guidance for mental health 35 percent feel no they don't brilliant and again thanks everybody for taking part in question three so again for the for the people that do do need more support help or guidance then as an organization we're here to help we've got the various different tools and training courses we can we can help and talk to you about um, equally it'd be worth thinking about talking to your employer or line manager about some of the things that you'd like to get involved with as an organization and if you're if you're an employer yourself on the call there's obviously a lot of resources out there for the for the 35 percent that don't need any great it's uh it's brilliant that you know, and i imagine it's um linked to the first question where it's almost an exact rep replication of the, of the scores because you're that you're the people that have already got all, a lot of this stuff in place which is brilliant here's how we can help we offer nationally accredited training i'm delivering a level two mental health first aid course next week um and we do those on a sort of a monthly basis so if you'd like anyone to attend please let us know um we can do that in your workplace or in a delegated venue so either or really we also do a mental health awareness workshop, which is a two hour workshop. You've largely experienced the first hour now, and the second hour is more about mental health first data and supportive conversations and workplace tools. Um, and you can, uh, staff can get a, uh, a, an awareness certificate at the end of that. So the delegated courses would be the mental health first aid level two. We actually run level three as well. At the moment we're running level two. We can abs absolutely help with policies, procedures, and documents whether they're risk assessments, whether they're policies, whether they are check sheets. And I offer a free 30 minute call on anything, health and safety, fire safety, uh, food, but also mental health. So please get in touch or I'm more than happy to book that in with anybody that's on the call uh, now to talk about any future needs. There's a long list there of useful links and there's probably loads more out there as well, but these are just some that we thought we'd put together for you, which with regards to anxiety, bipolar, men's health as well is very, very important at the moment. Uh, male suicide now is the biggest form of male death between the ages of 18 and 50 in men. So the fact that um, there's now various different forums and links and, and apps out there for men is really good. You'll all be aware of Mind and the Samaritans and things like that, but there's a number there that take a screenshot of that or, or make, note, make note of that when your presentation comes through. There's also text lines, which is great. And you can text shout to 85258 and again that could be something that you want to put on your boards you, they don't, you don't have to just access uh, a website there's there's different uh, text lines as well and obviously things like Samaritans and Mind are open 24 hours a day uh, for support so there's, there's there is loads of support out there it's not negative and I think it's, it should be seen as a positive that people are accessing the support and you guys as employers are, are allowing those them to do that and support them in the workplace We've got 10 minutes to go and I think we're going to hand back to Victoria to, to, to think about if there's any questions and you know thank you for joining today first webinar of the year so I wish you happy new year and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you Dom and just looking at um, we've got um, a few complicated ones I'm going to suggest that we um, apply separately afterwards but there's a more straightforward one and that's about the posters that you um, you shared an image um, yeah. and the question really is about where can they be downloaded from um, and it's specifically the slide 28 yeah okay so I mean if you if you, literally if you put into Google mental health posters there's a number that will come up um, largely the ones you saw to be honest there's certainly some links as well that I could probably put in, if I give them to yourself Victoria we could then yeah. send those out with the presentation and okay. then people can access those so if I send some links out and we'll do a separate page people can access those posters okay brilliant that's okay. thank you yeah that's right that's that's brilliant so that um, I'm going to take over the slides now and that brings us to the end of webinar so um, and before we go so um, that's the questions we have one more poll bear with me <laughs> that I would just like to ask um, for you to um, answer for us and it's the normal one that we do like to um, have at the end of our 
uh, webinar and it's around whether you think that we can help your business moving forward following today's webinar and um, if so which of the services would you like us to contact you uh, moving forward so please do have a, a, a vote and we will be in touch separately afterwards on that Thank you ever so much, everybody, for um, registering uh, that, for that information. And uh, before we close, I just want to let you know about our usual uh, upcoming webinars. We have a really um, interesting one tomorrow. It's an additional one that we're running this month. And it's everything you might want to ask about COVID from a HR and health and safety point of view. So it's not too late to register. We're running it tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and um, I'll be joined by Essential Safety and we're going to be taking your questions. Um, if you are able to come along, then we would like to ask that you register at the time of registration, put your question in the question box for us so that we um, can pull all the questions together in advance. Um, if not, then don't worry, we can take live questions as we go through the webinar. Um, but we plan to give everybody um, a brief update in terms of where we are with COVID. And then we're going to be opening the floor to all your HR and health and safety questions. So I really hope that you can join us for that in the morning. And then in terms of the um, webinar schedule, then our usual ones that we have coming up each month, we've got one in February, which is all about employee retention and how it's key to business success and what you can do to improve it. So we know there's, uh, you know, the great resignation we're all hearing about and the importance in trying to keep hold of your staff at this point in time. So um, there'll be a lot of information that we cover on there. So please do sign up to that if that's of interest. Dom is going to be running another health and safety webinar next month as well. Um, why do we bother with health and safety? So it would be great to see you on that. That's on the 24th. And then in March, the next webinar that I'll be doing is the importance of welfare meetings. So it's about giving advice and guidance for line managers on um, supporting you in regards to those meetings. And in April, we're moving on to disciplinary processes and in particular, how to write legally compliant conduct allegations. So there's some really um, interesting topics coming up. Um, and as I said, um, it's not too late to register for tomorrow morning's webinar all to do with COVID. And um, we also offer management courses. So you'll see here that we have ILM. Uh, level three that we are running uh, from February. We also um, have effective appraisal skills, disciplinary and grievance as part of our management development, equality and inclusion, uh, employment law for managers, and there's an ILM level five from March. So if any of those are interested uh, of interest to you, then please do check uh, the link out on our website and uh, we can find out how we can support you with that training. And then we do also have some upcoming health and safety courses. So Dom will be running a mental health first aid, emergency first aid at work, fire safety, food safety, um, and there's um, essential health and safety at work training courses that we also offer. So that does conclude our webinar today. So if you do have any questions for Dom, then uh, the details here on the, uh, on the slide um, as Dom has said, we will be providing a copy of the slides after the en event. Um, and um, if you would also like to stay in the loop and be amongst the first to be invited to any of our webinars, as well as receive the latest news, then you can also sign up to our newsletter, um, which covers payroll, health and safety, case rulings, uh, consultation, guidance, you name it, everything you could think from HR, health and safety and payroll. So please do uh, subscribe to our newsletter. And then we'll, uh, after the webinar, I'll be sending a short survey out just to capture any feedback. Um, we are really grateful to receive any of the feedback because it helps drive our webinar programme moving forward and it helps us with receiving that um, uh, feedback, constructive, you know, and positive feedback. So we always like to hear from you. 
And that brings me to the end. So I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy diary. Um, I know it's really busy for businesses in the new year. Um, and also thank you to Dom for giving up your time to help us understand more about mental ill health and how we can support everybody at work. It's really, really informative. So um, I think we're going to, um, everybody's going to take a lot of useful information away from that. So thank you very much, you. Dom. And so that brings us to the end of the webinar and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinars. Thank you, everybody.